uh, Donovan for this introduction and thank you Susan for bringing us all together. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, if my voice allows it, I will try to continue a dialogue that I had with Jean-Luc around the subject of mimesis, which inevitably brings in La Coulabart. And, and so my talk will resonate with many of the talks that we already had today. I say if I, my voice allows it because as you can hear, I have a bit of a sore throat, hopefully nothing serious. In any case, we are all safe. That's the advantage of the digital partage. If we want to put it, there are advantages to it. <clears throat> and in case there are problems, uh, Donovan uh, agreed uh, to follow up. And there will be a partage at the end anyway by changing medium and uh, a little surprise, but, uh, but I'll leave that uh, for the end. I changed my subtitle slow, uh, slightly, which now reads Nancy Lacou's Communal Metaxis. The title is always shared voices. What's in a voice? And if the echoes a voice generates are neither singular nor plural, but singular plural, what shared voices animate Jean-Luc Nancy's untimely reflections on subjectivity, community, and being in common? The answers to such questions are necessarily multiple and do not conform to univocal interpretations confined to the logic of identity or the same. On the contrary, they are animated by a voice that gave a singular tone, timbre, and touch to an ontology of difference that dominated the French philosophical scene from the 1970s to the 90s and whose echoes, as this conference brilliantly demonstrates, reach well into the present and will resonate for a long time to come. These echoes are particularly strong when it comes to the question of community and an experience of finitude it entails, and for a reason that is double. First, because Nancy urges us to rethink the shared experience of being in common in an age prey to the Shilla of atomistic isolation and the Charybdis of new fascist fusions. And second, because Nancy indicated that loss is constitutive of community itself. And like Georges Bataille before him, he stressed death as the inner experience or experience interior that exposes communal existence to a shared finitude. Animated by a feeling of loss in the presence of a community of thinkers and friends that it shared a singular rapport with Jean-Luc, I take the occasion of this conference to recall that Nancy was equally sensitive to the counterpart of death, as he stressed, for instance, I quote, that only community can, pre can present me my birth by which he meant the birth of a singular plural subject who co-appears or compares with others by a mysterious form of communication that transgresses the boundaries of individuation. His non-linguistic, perhaps sovereign, and certainly contagious communication is at the palpitating heart of an experience of sharing or partage that paradoxically both divides and unites self and other, compares in a relation of communication with another who is already internal to what the ego is, ego sum, or is in the process of becoming other, ego sum alterum. And see, some sums up this partage in the paradoxical affirmation, you shares me, toi partage moi. How does this partage operate and wherein lies its effective power of communication? I would like to suggest that the inner experience of a mimesis without a model he is for him, but not only, always already shared, passing like a magnetic current across traditionally opposed yet mirroring discourses that still tend to be grouped under the agonistic rubric of literature and philosophy, or to use more classical terms, mythos and logos. Perhaps this effective mimesis without proper identity even animates the experience of a sharing or partage that generates a double movement of receptivity to the pathos of the other and critical distance from it. This double movement of pathos of distance is the palpitating, palpitating heart of a theory of homoemeticals I've been developing over the past decade and found in the late Nancy a key ally to promote a mimetic turn or return of attention to mimesis in different areas of critical theory. You will have guessed it. My hypothesis is that Nancy's untimely reflections on the sharing of the subject constitutive of being in common that finds in the exposure of finitude and death its clearest manifestation cannot be dissociated from his life in common with a singular thinker who made the problematic of mimesis, mimesis, its guiding threat or fil conducteur. 
namely the French philosopher, poet, man of the theater, and life lifelong friend and collaborator and sharer of community, Philippe Lacoulabart. It is well known, and it has been said many times, that Nancy and Lacoulabart's intellectual careers find a shared starting point in a number of co-authored books that go from their philosophical interpretation of Lacan in the title of the letter to their genealogy of romanticism in the literary absolute, from their account of the mimetic logical or mimetology of Nazism, as in the Nazi myth, to the edited volume on, on retreating the political, among other texts in common. Perhaps less known in general, but I think many of you know it here, is that a less visible, more private, yet no less shared experience of thought or logos is redoubled by a sharing of affect or pathos, whose conjunctive disjunction provides perhaps the coup d'envoi or stoßpunkt that will set these singular yet shared literary philosophical careers in motion. My contention is that the shared experience of a mimetic metexis or participation, what Nancy also calls mimesis participative with la Coulabart, plays a key role in giving birth to Nancy's singular plural thought on community. Short of reconstructing the centrality of a different thought of communal metexis in Nancy's work that informs his never ending dialogue with Lacoulabart, I take but a first step in this direction by considering the shared problematic of mimetic metexis from both the set of affective experience or pathos and the one of conceptual thought or logos without setting up a binary between these mirroring perspectives. On the side of logos, I turn to a short platonic dialogue called Ion where the relation of metaxis generates a sharing of voices or partage de roi that is constitutive of the agonistic relation between philosophy and literature, Plato and Homer, and that some removes, perhaps also Nancy and La Coulabart. And Isa already talked about this text. On the side of pathos, I will try something more experimental, but closer to home. I will let Jean-Luc narrate the myth, the myth of community by changing participatory medium. I will be brief and schematic in my remarks so as to allow Jean-Luc to speak for himself in his own proper or rather redoubled voice. But let us proceed in order. In a book titled Le Partage de Voix, Nancy reloads the ancient quarrel between philosophy and poetry by an interpretation of a short platonic dialogue called Ion on the nature of literary inspiration but also interpretation. Ion, we'll recall, is a rhapsod, a professional reciter of oral poetry specialized in Homer and just won a prize in a contest. It has served as Plato's antagonist for a literary philosophical contest that stage, stages Socrates contra the representative of an oral mythic culture, which as Eric Havelock has shown, was central to the education of the Greeks and that Plato seeks to replace. In substance, contra this, this oral tradition, Socrates argues that Ion, and I want to remove Homer, is dispossessed of any knowledge or episteme. He even lacks mastery of a poetic craft or art, techne, as if reciting the old Odyssey or Iliad by heart were not a technical feat. Instead, Socrates argues that Ion can impersonate Homer because he's divinely inspired or entails that is possessed by a power divine that passes through him by a mysterious magnetic communication. How does such communication work? Within the dialogue itself, Socrates convokes the allegorical trope of a magnet that has the property to transmit its magnetism to iron rings, forming a long chain that goes from Apollo to the muses, to the poet, Homer, to the rhapsod, reaching to affect the communal audience in the theater. That's reframed, Ion turns out to be a middle ring, a medium or passeur, who is both held and possessed by a contagious power of inspiration that ensures what Nancy calls the passage of communication, whose primary characteristic is to be shared, or as Nancy will later say, in common. Written in 1982, at a transitional moment of passage from a decade of intense work in common with La Coulabart, to Nancy's singular work on community based on the paradoxical logic of partage, Le Partage de Voix is a singular plural text that operates on more than one level, for there is indeed more than one voice that is shared. First, 
is magnetic or communicative force is poetic, passes through, through the voice of ion, but also connects and disconnects the rings in the chain that are, to be specific, unchained, déchaînés. In fact, the rings are not chained into one another, but adjacent to each other, each singular in their poetic powers, but magnetized by the same power or pathos that shares divides them. Second, Nancy also notes that the partage goes beyond poetic principles for it passes across the literature, philosophy, mythos, logos divide as well. As he puts it, Plato's dialogue stages a competition or agon between the philosopher and another. Interestingly, this agon does not simply oppose the pathos of poetry to the logos of philosophy. On the contrary, Nancy specifies that it is a question of, quote, showing that the philosopher is better in the domain of the other, or that he is the truth of the other. And he adds that Socrates envies not so much the prize, but the art, that is the techne, of the rhapsode himself. There is thus a mirroring, or as I call it, mimetic agonism between Socrates and Ion, the philosopher and its literary other, whom Nancy says, plays the role of a rival or double. He also adds that this double is characterized by a strange dispossession or depropriation of identity because as Nancy specifies, he has nothing proper, rien en propre. Literature and philosophy, doubles and dispossessions, and a singular plural subject who has nothing proper. This contagious magnetic force endowed with the power of partage that is not proper to ion alone, but whose characteristic is that it is shared across the literature philosophy divide is nothing less than the improper question of mimesis. As Nancy puts it, I quote, one must conclude that the rhapsod is here the representative of the singularly complex problematic of mimesis. Not a mimesis that passively copies the original poet by the singular scheme of representation predicated on the logic of the same. Rather, a complex poetic or rather dramatic mimesis characterized as a magnetic transitive force or power that is less characterized by a figuration than the ability to transform what Nancy calls receptivity that gives rise to an activity. And Nancy continues, this is an active, creative, or recreative mimesis, or alternatively, it is a mimetic creation, but effectuated via mimesis that emerges from a taxis, from a participation itself due to the communication of enthusiasm, unless mimesis is not the condition of this participation. There is thus an undecidable, paradoxical, and above all, productive mimesis at play in this ancient agon between philosophy and poetry, Plato and Homer, Socrates and Ion, a mimetic agon that is as much based on an opposition and continuity, that is, on a sharing of voices that exceeds the logic of mimetic rivalry. If only because this partage between philosophical and poetic voices does not lead to any violence, let alone sacrificial exclusions, as is already the case in the Republic, and more recently in the work of René Girard. Rather, in Ion, the magnetic force sets in motion what Nancy calls a partage of poetic and philosophical genre, generating a productive interplay of pathos and logos I call pathologi, which is constitutive of platonic dialogues, with its heroes, myths, allegories, etc., and perhaps of the birth of philosophy itself out of a mimetic power. This is a schematic overview, but this scene of origins is beginning to delineate itself. The echoes are becoming audible. Beneath the mimetic agon between Socrates and Ion, philosophy and literature, also lies a third couple of literary philosophical doppelgangers closer to us. Mimesis is in fact, not only an ancient concept internal to platonic dialogues. It is also a concept at play in the imitation of the moderns that inform what we started calling in the company of Nancy, a mimetic turn or return to different forms of more participatory and embodied mimesis central to understanding of contemporary problems from new fascism to pandemic crisis. This is in fact the moment to register that the partage de voix Nancy explicitly theorizes within the interpretation of the platonic dialogue is already redoubled by an implicit dialogue on dialogue, that is, 
a dialogue on a shared experience of mimetic participation between literature and philosophy that operates in its communal experience of thought and life as well. In foundational works like Typography, Limitazione Moderna, The Echo of the Subject, among other works in common with Nancy, La Coulabart, in fact, made an original interpretation of mimesis with our proper models, the guiding thread, or fil conducteur, as I said, of his entire literary philosophical career. His account of the impropriety of the mimetic subject, its plastic malleability, and the paradoxical ability of the actor to turn a restrictive or passive mimesis into a productive mimesis, characteristic of Diderot in particular, and the imitation of the moderns in general, find in Plato a key genealogical starting point. All this and more is echoed in Nancy's interpretation of Plato's Rhapsod, a figure Nancy acknowledged that enchanted Philip precisely for its anticipation of the modern insight that I put in the look, the actor has nothing proper to itself. It is thus no accident that Nancy not only quotes La Coulabart's account of Diderot's paradox of the actor a few pages later, he also leans on this paradox to give mimetic specificity to his genealogy of shared voices. And she, in fact, tells us that this dispossessed subject has nothing proper, rien en propre, to itself. And paradoxically, precisely because of this absence of proper capacity or depropriation, this dispossessed figure enters into an enthusiastic state of creative receptivity that is both passive and active, or better, turns passivity into activity. As reframed, my Mises is no longer restricted to copying a model. On the contrary, the magnetic spell of a mimetic metexis generates a sharing of voices constitutive of a singular plural subject who both on the level of philosophical logos and literary pathos is already exposed to the experience of being in common. In the end, there is perhaps an echo of the subject or a mimetic phantom animating the paradoxical voice of that mime de rien who accounts for the paradox of what I call echoing both Nancy and La Bart or La Cunancy, if you want, homo mimeticus. Within this echo chamber, based on the alteration of voices, it is indeed no longer clear whose voice exactly speaks. In a chiastic mirroring phrase that sums up the paradox of mimetic metexis at play in the Platonic dialogue, and perhaps but to remove in his own, I would not say proper, but shared literary philosophical voice as well, Nancy says, I quote, a philosophical rhapsody allows for a philosophy of rhapsody. And what is Nancy's unclassifiable thought, if not also a philosophy of rhapsodies on, on the muses, intoxication, love, the body, and the arts more generally? In the process, the Nancy Lacula the Nancy Laku duet generated a long chain of rings that goes not only from the muses to the community of spectators in ancient Greece, but also connects like a magnetic flow singular plural beings at the heart of an inoperative, cooperative community of thought that this conference shows lives on in the present. On that note, I interrupt my account to introduce a change of medium and voice. This will allow me to let Jean-Luc speak for himself. We will hear him narrate with a singular plural voice, a communal myth that gave birth to the Partage de Bois in the first place. I thought it would be only appropriate that among a plurality of possible communities, you or full people would be the first to see and hear it. <laughs> 